Good morning, Movement Church. Man, I tell you, what a what an awesome time of worship, huh? When is it good? Man, oh man. Uh, already had one service and, and uh, excited about this one. Uh, really, really excited to kick off this series. They asked me to, to start it and um, to kick it off. And man, it's an honor for me to, to get to kick off a series. Um, you know, nothing in your life, nothing uh, will influence your life more than your emotions. And today... We're going to be talking about, um, you know, the series Unbreakable, but I'm going to talk to you about grace-empowered emotions because here's the deal. You, you either live your life, you know, based on what you can do or you live your life based on what God did. And I don't know about you. I know what I can do because I can look at the weaknesses in my life and the bad things in my life and know that's what I did. That's how good I am. Come on. But hallelujah, we, we have something better than that. We have the grace of God living within us that will empower us and help us to, to experience all that, that God is. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about a verse of Scripture jotted in my notes before the, before the service. It won't be on the screen. You know, Jesus said, Jesus said in John 14, 27, he said, Peace I leave with you. G- uh, Lori tapped into this. said, Peace I leave with you. He said, this, this peace that I'm leaving you is not as the world gives I'm giving you something different. I'm going to give you something that, that will last. I'm going to give you some peace that will go beyond your circumstances, that, that you'll be able to have peace when, when the storms are raging in your life. I'm going to give you a peace that passes all understanding, as Paul said. And then Jesus said in, in Luke 21, I love this verse. He said, verse 26, that there would come a time where men's, people's hearts would fail them. Now, he's not talking about the one that pumps blood. But he said men's hearts would fail them because they would start looking at the things that are coming upon the earth. Now, if you look at what's coming up on your life, you will never be able to live in peace. But if there's, So there's got to be something that Jesus was talking about that we can look to and look at in order to have peace no matter what's going on in our life. Because, you know, Jesus said in another scripture in John, he said, he said in the world, he said, you will have tribulation. But he didn't stop there. He said, be of good cheer. He said, I've overcome the world. So he gives us some, some, some uh, real clues to this, and we're going to talk about this, how that we can have peace no matter, no matter what's happening in our lives. So, so today, uh, you know, before we end the service, I'm going to give you three things toward the end of the, my message here that's going to help you uh, identify or tap into how you can live with grace-empowered emotions. God wants you to live a life full of peace, life full of joy, a life full of happiness. Listen, what I'm saying, regardless of what's happening in your life. Listen, if you let, if you think peace, you're going to only be able to have peace when everything's perfect in your life. You know that's called heaven. <laughs> and the only time everything's going to be the way you want it is when you go to heaven. Up until then, you got to learn how to deal with this stuff. Okay. Now, this is what it says in in, in Genesis chapter two. Starting with chapter 2, verse 7, it says, And God formed man out of the dirt of the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. He became a a social being. He became a a, a creature with all kinds of emotions. And the Bible says that we're created in the image and likeness of God. So the emotions that you and I have are God-created emotions. Now, how we handle these emotions it's up to us whether we allow the God kind of emotions to spring forth in our life. So we are a three-part being. Pastor Jill taught on this some time ago, uh, not, not too long ago. Actually, she brought this out, that we are a three-part being. We are a spirit, and that, that is the part that connects to God. That's the part of you that was made perfect when you received Jesus into your life. Hebrews 12, 23 tells us the spirits of righteous people that have been made perfect. So thank God there's something perfect in your life. Your spirit is perfect. You know, we don't always act perfect, but our spirit is perfect. And then we're a soul. We're a mind, will, and emotions. This part of you is being saved. This part of you is a constant, ongoing work. It's not a one-time experience. It's something that you continually have to work on. And that's what Romans says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. Now, when I first, when I first came a believer in 1980, 
I thought, and I don't know, you, you're not this dumb, but I thought all my emotional problems were going to go away. Yeah. How many of you realize they didn't? Matter of fact, I was angry. I lived, I lived a life full of anger, and all I realized after I got saved was I was now an angry Christian. And then I started mixing rules and regulations with it, and I become a legalistic angry Christian, okay? And then I was called to preach, and on top of that. So you can imagine what that preaching was like, okay? Okay, so we're spirit, soul. You know, I preached like you were going to hell, and I was happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cut them up. You cut me up good today, Pastor. Forgot to sell you up, but you, know, you, you cut us up good. So we're spirit, Somebody said, I wish I'd have heard you 35 years ago. No, you don't. <laughs> Trust me. You don't want to hear that. All right, so we're spirit, soul, and we are a body. Your body is the house you live in. That's all it is. You know, this, this body will be saved one day. You know, so our spirit is saved, soul is being saved, body will be saved. See, our, our body is only the house we live in. That's the part of us we relate to the world with, okay, that, the, that we touch people with, that we're, we're part of people's life through this body. But that's only the house that you live in. Now, all of us live in a house, uh, an apartment, a car, a tent, something. We live in something, okay? All right, so, but that's not who we are. You know, Janice and I live in a house, that's not us, that's just where we live. And your body is the same thing. Your body is only the house that you live in. You ever, you know, go to a memorial service, a viewing or whatever, you know, and you walk by and, and they say, boy, don't he look good. I mean, how are they supposed to look? They, they sure do look good for, to be dead. And, but you know what, that's really, that's not really them. They're, they're not there. That's just the house they lived in. That's all it is. That's just the house. And just like the physical house, apartment that you live in, that physical house you know, that you live in will decay. And this body will decay. But thank God, Jesus said, and he gives us hope, and Paul gave us hope, that there coming a day when we will get a new body. And there will be no aches and pains in this body. You will be able to eat all the nachos you want to, and it's not going to bother you. You know, you're going to, isn't it amazing, Rod, Rod always likes this, the, one of the first things it talks about when we get to heaven is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Woo! Right off the bat, he's throwing a party. Come on. And you're not going to have to push back from the table. You're going to just, you know, belly up, okay, and, and ha have a big time. Okay, so, but we're spirit, soul, and body. Okay, so when we, like I said, when we became believers, you know, our, our spiritual problems went away. We don't have any spiritual problems anymore. We have soul problems. We have mind, will, and emotion problems, okay? You, when our soul is out of balance, this is what I'm saying, when our soul is out of balance in our lives, you know, getting saved did not cure that. Now, my, my bad language that I used before I got saved did not stop the day I gave my life to Jesus in 1980. I wish it had it. I thought it would. But as soon as I hit my head the first time, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth did speak. I mean, some things come out of me, and I'm thinking, if you was a Christian, you wouldn't have said that. I ain't never heard a Christian say that. Well, you see, that's my soul talking. You know, that, that's my mind, will, and emotions. And that is a process of bringing change, okay? Now, emotional issues left undealt with brings, bring destruction. And as believers, a lot of times, we live our life with a lot of extra baggage, a lot of emotional baggage. And people, we go through life with, with deep emotional issues. People with deep emotional issues, here's, here's some problems with that. Number one, they they're often, are often paralyzed by their feelings. They're, they're afraid to try new things. Number two, they read things into things that people say that they didn't say. You ever, you ever seen somebody do that? I, I know you're talking about me. I remember one time, Janice and I were, were having, I uh, was in Florida, we hadn't been in Florida long, and so we're having lunch with a group of people from church, and you know, I don't know, it's 15, 20 people, whatever, around this long table at, at Pizza Hut, and, and uh, so 
I, I don't do good in that setting, generally speaking. In, um, so anyway, so I was at, was at this table, and people were sitting there talking, and, and one lady brought up a certain young man in the church who had had you know, long hair. Now, the lady that brought it up, her son had hair like halfway down his back, okay? So she brought up that uh, this certain young man in the church had got a haircut. And said, does it, and called his name, said, does it his, doesn't his haircut look, haircut look good? Another woman said, you throwing that at me? Are you, talking, are, are you throwing that at my son because he's got long hair? Now, I don't know how she forgot, but this lady's got a son with hair halfway down his back. See, when you've got a lot of emotional baggage, you read things into things that are not reality. And you walk in, you're, you know, if you've got a lot, a lot of emotional baggage and you walk into a room and people are talking and they stop talking, you think they're talking about you. It may just be what they're talking about is none of your business. <laughs> Why ain't it my business? I want it to be my business. Well, some things just not your business, okay? Okay, people with deep emotional issues find it hard to trust others. It's like when you've been hurt in a relationship, if, until you become whole, it, it, it's hard for you to trust other people, okay? It's hard. Listen, if you've been hurt in church, it's hard for you to come to a new church and trust. And that's okay. Because you know, the, you know, the truth of the matter is, the Bible says trust is based on track record. And people have to prove they can be trusted, okay? Number four, people who have deep emotional issues play the I think you think game. You know, I don't even know what I think most of the time, much less what you think. I think Josh thinks. Well, what I don't know what Josh thinks unless Josh tells me what he thinks. But people with deep emotional issues, they constantly battle that. Number five, uh, they have the same type of problems over and over again. Listen to this. If you, this will help you. My name is Alan. I'm trying to help you. That if you have the same reoccurring issues in your life, it's not because you're unlucky. It's because you got some faulty beliefs. And you keep having these things happen to you over and over again because, not because the world ganged up against you, but because of some faulty beliefs and probably a lot of baggage that you're carrying. Number six, they're often difficult to get along with. Well, I'm going to skip on past that one. <laughs> Number seven, they're prone to sickness. Uh-oh. Now, I'm not saying every sickness, but I'm saying they're prone to sickness. Come on, <laughs> Come on now. Preaching good, she said. <laughs> but it's the truth. But when you, when you, when you, Again, I'm not saying every sickness, so please, please hear me. I'm not saying that. This has been recorded, okay? Because don't go out here saying, well, pastor said that every time you're sick, it's because you got a most issue. No, I, I didn't say that. I said, if you are prone to sickness, more times than not, you are dealing with some emotional things that you pushed aside, and it's dealing, listen, you know, I, I said this to someone the other day, and I thought I was crazy. It wasn't the first thing I ever said, people thought I was crazy. But I learned a long time ago that every cell, the science tells us, that every cell in your body knows everything you know. And that's hard for people to understand and swallow. So therefore, if I believe certain things, every cell in my body goes to work to create that to happen in my life. Okay? Everybody doing all right? Are these people over here seem to be doing okay? <laughs> I can't see you who you are, but I'm hearing you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but okay, not, another thing that they're prone to do is they're prone to depression. Now, I don't know that, how many of you have, have really had depression issues. Now, I'm not talking about something bad happened, you got depressed. I'm not talking about that. Anybody does that. But I'm talking about you were really clinically depressed. I mean, you were like, go to bed, pull the cover up over my head, not for an hour or two, but for days. I'm talking about you you just get where you you can't function. Now, if you've never been there, let me just let you in on something. Stop telling people what they should do that are that way. You ain't got a clue. Been there and done that. When I was that way, people say, well, you know, you just need to get over it. (laughs) Oh, yeah, Captain Obvious, don't you think I know that? I need to get over it. That's what they tell me. That's what they tell me, Josh. They say, well, you need to get over it. 
Duh. Boy, you're brilliant. Thank you. I, I, I'm glad you told me. And they'd say, well, you've got too many things to, to be happy about. Know that. Know that. See, I can be just like I am right now, happy, walk out the door. And if you've ever had depression, you, you can understand this. It'd be just like clicking on a light switch. All of a sudden, you're depressed for no reason. Nothing happened. Nothing took place. You know, I don't, you know, I don't understand all that, but all I know is, is that's the way I lived a lot of my life. And, and it's, it's a sad thing. It's a sad thing to do. But see, I realized something. A lot of that was caused by a lot of emotional baggage I was carrying in my life. That's what I'm saying. Spirit-filled, tongue-talking, preacher, depressed. Your pastor, Jill, I, mean, I can remember, you know, her getting so whacked out emotionally that she, she'd bring Abby half-dressed to, to work and, and, you know, and I mean, it, it was just, her diaper hadn't been changed and since the last time Roderick changed it and, and it, was, it was awful. And, and I remember one day, you know, she, she couldn't come to church. Now, she's on my staff. She's on our, our Janice High staff. And I remember one day, it was on a Sunday, and I told Rod, I said, just hang around here. Let me go, let me go back after church and talk to her. So I go back, and, and I would get there. I find her rolled up in a, in a blanket and a ball on the couch crying. And I remember just, you know, just holding her and hugging her and, and, and saying, honey, we're going to get you through this. Whatever we have to do, we're going to do it. You know, you're going to get through this. You know, been there, done that. You're going to come out of this. And, and thank God she did. And, and thank God she did. Now, so, so again, if, if you've never dealt with that, don't tell people you need to get over it. I'm telling you, that does not help them. It does not help them. So they're prone, you know, to uh, depression. You know, when I was that way, I was uh, really sick back in the 80s, uh, you know, going toward checking out of this life, going, you know, dying, you know, looked like and, you know, felt like, wanted to and, and all that stuff. And Lori wasn't born yet. So Jill, Jill was uh, young. And uh, anyway, so I was in the hospital this particular time. And Janice tells the story much better than I do because it happened to her. But I, I, uh, I was so depressed. I was sick. Now, now I've always been, been a big guy. Not necessarily as big as I am now, but I've always been a big guy. And, and so I'd lost so much weight that I could reach around my leg at the top, at the thigh, right there. So I'm, I mean, I, it, I was just, I was sick, dying, and on top of that, depressed, okay? We see a tongue-talking, Bible-toting, word-speaking preacher. Come on. Wow. See, that does not make you immune. Right. That's right. Let's talk about it. So one night, you know, and I've told this before, but, but uh, I, I was so depressed and I, I, you know, I thought I was scared. I was scared I was going to die. And I, and I, I would, I didn't want to be at the hospital by myself because I was afraid I'd die and nobody would be there to see it or something. I don't know what the deal was with that, but, but it's like I, I, Janice would go home and I'd just drive her crazy. When, you, when you're going to get back? When you're going to get back? Good thing didn't have cell phones in because you know, she got a little bit of relief because she, she couldn't talk to me for, until she got home. It was about an hour drive. And so when are you coming back? How long is it going to be? And da 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 da. And so. Um, and it got where they wouldn't leave me by myself at the hospital. And so one night, you know, in the night, you know, I don't know what time in the night, she had done everything. She had prayed. She had confessed. She had done all the stuff, you know. And, and I remember hearing her tell it. She said, the, the, the rock of my life, the love of my life, I'm losing him physically, but he's checked out on me emotionally. He's not the guy I married. And so she said she went down to a little snack room there at the hospital, a little snack area, little tables in there, and said she just laid her head over, and all she said she could say for ever how long, for a long time, is she just cried, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let me tell you something. When you're desperate, you don't, you don't have to have formulas. God hears your heart. Well, she, did, she does that for ever how long, you know, and so she comes back to the room. The next day, a preacher that I went to licensing school with when I was in a denominational church, he shows up to see me. Just shows up. No, he didn't just show up. He comes to see me, talks to me a little bit, says, I want to pray with you. He kneels down on my left side, lays his hand on me, and begins to pray in the spirit over me. Now, I don't, I wish I could say, dun, 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 Jesus walked in, and I was raised up out of the sick bed and walked out of there whole. That didn't happen. But I'll tell you what did happen. Something changed in here. Listen to what I'm saying. Something's always got to change in here 
before it changes out here. And if I had not had that breakthrough, I wouldn't be here. Went through a major surgery in 87. I was on hospital. I was on operating table seven and a half hours. I, I went through a major surgery in 1987. And had I not had that breakthrough, there wouldn't be a movement church. Yeah. Right. There wouldn't be a Lori Beth. I'd been dead before she came. I went, I, you know, and so I don't, I don't know how our, our well, I know how my life would have been, but I don't know how their life would have been. Um, I'd been into heaven. Uh, but anyway, um, so this depression thing is something that if, if you do not learn how to deal with emotional issues, you'll carry it to your grave. But I've got good news for you. You don't have to. Right. Number nine, they're, they're, uh, they project their feelings on others. Number 10, they're more likely to take their own life. That's sad, isn't it? How sad it is when somebody takes their life. Here's some alarming stats. I'm going to read these really quick. Uh, I read, this blew me away. Alarming stats on suicide. Suicide takes the lives of over 400, excuse me, 44,965 Americans each year. Suicide is the 10th leading cause of death among all ages in America. Wow. On the average, 129 people commit suicide every day. I think, I think there's like 400,000 attempts that, that didn't succeed. We had a lady in our church in Florida. Uh, she and her husband went through a real bad divorce, and, and a, lot of, a lot of stuff happened. She tried to kill herself. And I remember she sat in my office when her failed attempt to kill herself didn't work. And I remember her telling me this. With tears running down her face, she said, I can't even kill myself good. She said, I'm a failure at everything, even at killing myself. And it disfigured her body, it messed her up. I mean, it's just total, total, total tragedy. Okay, in 2017, men died by suicide 3.54 more often times than women. White males accounted for 69.67% of suicide deaths in 2017. Suicide is uh, among males, uh, you know, that, again, almost 70%, just, just white men. But suicide among males is four times higher than among females. I was talking to somebody, other day. now I have heard of it, but said, I was talking to somebody about this at work, and I said, isn't that amazing? And then we sat there and we talked as me and uh, my, my niece, and she said, Uncle Al, I can't name maybe one or two women that I've ever heard of that killed, that I, that I personally knew that killed herself. So I can name you a bunch of men. Listen to me, guys. That's a warning sign. I mean, it's a, it's a warning sign for anybody. But the, war, the problem is, you know, women are often just as depressed, but women are more likely to reach out for help. Yeah. 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 Guys, it doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're not macho. It doesn't mean that you're not the man of the house. It doesn't re Listen, if you ever even thought about it, you know, if you ever think about it, deal with it. Get somebody to help you. Yes. I mean, because we don't want you to be one of those stats. No, no, no. And I could have easily done that at one point. I could have easily done that. But you know what? You know the reason I couldn't? I looked at her, and I looked at her. Lori wasn't born yet, and I said, I can't give up. I can't give into this sickness. I can't give into this emotional problems that I'm having. With, with at least I cannot die without fighting. And that's one of the major things. You got to look at why you need to live. Let me tell you something, guys. I didn't say, I didn't say all this part in the first service. Let me tell you something, guys. Let me tell you, let me tell you. Your family needs you. You may feel like a failure. You may feel like that nothing you've ever done matters. You may feel like the, the, the biggest failure in the world. Let me tell you something. Your family needs you. Don't do it. Don't do it. See, when you read all the stats, it sounds hopeless, but through Jesus and our faith in him, we can overcome. You know, nothing in our lives influence our lives more than the quality of our emotions, and nothing, you know, in our life, nothing. 
influences our emotions than the way we see ourselves in Jesus or our, our sense of identity. Here's some questions that reveal the sense of identity. You know, what do you really, or excuse me, how do you really feel about yourself? Really? No, no. Listen, don't answer that question how you think it should be answered, but how do you really feel? When, when no one's around to encourage you, how do you see yourself? How do you allow, how, excuse me, how have you allowed this, your struggles to become your sense of identity? See, a lot of times people do that. They go through hard spots in their life and they make that their identity. Like they're, they're, they're abused or they, they, like me, they had an anger problem or, or whatever, and that becomes their identity. You, you become known as the angry person. You become known as the abused person. You become known as all that. But let me tell you something. We may be the way we are. You've heard me say this a lot. You, we may be with the way we are because of what other people do to us, uh, have done to us. But listen, we stay the way we are by our choices. And I'm telling you, you are in a safe church where it's okay to have problems. Amen? Amen. Now, Romans chapter 12 says, here it gives us the answer. We've got to become fully persuaded of our identity. Be not conformed, Romans 12 2, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind, that you may prove or experience how good, acceptable, and perfect God's will is. See, now listen, get this statement. Beliefs are written on our hearts. Beliefs are written on our hearts when both emotion and information come together. That's what I'm saying. The way we write beliefs on our heart is when both emotion and information come together. Both of these guys, they, they, they have to come together. See, and if you want to change your life for the better, you want to change your emotional state, you know, our capacity to experience life is never going to go beyond the way we see ourselves in Jesus. Now, this is what this says in 1 John 4.17. Herein is love made perfect or mature, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment or the day of decision. This is, because as he is, not as he's going to be, not as he was when he walked, but as he is, so are we in this world. Now, let me, let me just take just a second and tell you this. As Jesus is right now is the way you are. What do you mean? You are. Now, this shakes religious people up, I'm telling you. You are as accepted by God as Jesus. You are as loved by God as Jesus is. Listen to this. See, that's got to become our sense of identity. That's got to become our sense of worth, our value. Because when, when it does, it starts changing our emotions. See, the way I came out of the anger issues and the way I came out of the depression issues, yeah, thank God, and, and, and Lori mentioned it earlier, thank God for people that pray with us. And that, that guy prayed with me that day, and it sparked something in me. It's like jump-starting a car. You know, you can jump-start a car, but if you don't fix either the alternator or put a new battery in it, you got to jump-start it again. And so when you, when you jump-start a car, you, you've got to, Find out why the battery is dead. And that's the same way it is with, with you and I in, in our walk with God. Somebody may be able to pray for us, but if we don't change our beliefs, we're not going to keep it. We're going to slide back to the way we were. Nobody can fix it for you. I mean, as great as it is to be involved in a, in a, in a church that teaches you God's unconditional love, if that does not drive your emotions, it will not help you. It will frustrate you. As he is, right now, so are we. Man, not someday down the road when we get to heaven, but right now. Again, I say it again. You are as accepted as Jesus is. You're as loved as Jesus is loved. I mean, that, that's mind-blowing. That's, that's beyond comprehension. But that's what the Bible says. And see, we got to write that truth on our heart because when Emotion and information come together, it changes us. This truth will change our emotions. Ephesians 4 says, verse 22, put off uh, concerning the former conversation, the, the old lifestyle of the old man, 
which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You got to renew your mind about this. You got to you got to change the way you you got to change the way you think about it. And that's what Romans twelve two says in the New Living Translation. It says that God will transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. The way you think, okay. So how do we, how do we renew our minds? How, how do we renew our minds? Because Psalm 23, verse 3 says, he restores our soul. Okay, number one, let me get you these real quick. Number one, read your Bible. It's like Bible, Bible. <laughs> read it. You know, I, I guess I was talking, telling our journey students this the other night, it may be because of my age, but for me, I'm not saying for you, I'm saying for me. I get more out of reading a printed paper Bible than I do the electronic. Now, that just, I know a lot of that's just age, you know, because, you know, some of you younger, you know, you, pr- you may get more out of reading uh, the, with the app on your, bi- on your phone or whatever, and that's fine. But read your Bible. Everybody say, say, read, read. my Bible. Oh. Now, wouldn't that be crazy if we just start reading our Bibles? Amazing what can happen in our life if we just read our Bibles for the right reason. Here's the reason. Read your Bible to find out who you really are. Right. You don't read the Bible to find out what you did wrong. Come on. You don't read your Bible to see where you messed up. Wow. Wow. See, who you really are is not what you've done. Hebrews 12, as 4 12 says. Uh, everything, it says, whatever God says is full of living power. It's sharper than his sharpest dagger. It, cutting swift and deep into the innermost thoughts and desires of, of all their parts. Exposing us for what we really are. Yeah, and what you really are is not what you've done, good or bad. Come on. You are who God says you are. Yes. Well, I feel like a failure. Well, that's just a feeling. You're not a failure. 2 Corinthians 3.18, all of us, as with an unveiled face, because we continue to behold in the word of God as in a mirror. He says, reading your Bible is like looking in a mirror. When you look in a mirror, you see what you look like. And when you read your Bible to find out who you really are, you start seeing pictures of who you are. You start getting a glimpse of, of who you are. He said, and when you do that, you're constantly being transfigured into the very own image in increasing Increasing splendor from one degree of glory, view and opinion, to another degree. And this comes from the Lord. So you read your Bible. Everybody say, read your Bible. Wouldn't that be wild if we just started reading our Bibles? Read my Bible. Where do you get that from? The Bible. If we start reading the Bible to to find out who we really are, like starting Galatians. Ephesians, and read those two books right there. And look at, look at all the times it talks about who you are. And when you do that, you're looking in a mirror and you're seeing a perfect picture of who you are. You see a perfect image of the person you are. That'll change, that'll change your emotions. Number two, meditate on Bible verses about your identity. So you read through there and you find them. I used to have index cards. I'd have them. I I would put them in my truck, you know, doing construction work, and I'd put them in my truck, and I'd pull those at lunch. I'd pull those out, you know, and I'd read those index cards that have Bible verses on it, Bible verses on it, and Bible verses on it. You know, I don't, you know, no one, maybe somebody told me to do that. I don't know, but I did that. I'm telling you, it, it it transformed my life. Because I started seeing myself different. This is what it says. Psalm chapter 1 verse 2 says that his delight is in the law or the word of the Lord. And in his word does he meditate day and night. That word day just means daily. I used to read that and think you got to meditate all day. And all night. All day and all night. Didn't realize one day, you know what that word day means? Just do it daily. Just as you go through your day, it's good to have a time you set apart, but just as you go through your day, just meditate on those verses that you've you know, found. And, uh, you know, you that use a smartphone to do that stuff, um, and I do too. I've got in my, in my notes, I've got verses that I'll read sometimes, you know, and I can keep that phone with me all the time. And, I mean, you can't even go to the store without your phone now. So, uh, you know, so I just pull that notes out, and I just see those verses. 
that, I, that I've captured and, and, and put in there. But then he says, at night. He says, meditate on it day and night. And that word night just simply means as you're winding down. As you're about to go to sleep. Let the last words that you meditate on be on your identity. Okay? Number three then, speak your identity. The book of Philemon says in 1.6, faith, your faith becomes effective by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. You see, the most, one of the most powerful tools in the world that God has given us uh, to transform our lives and change our thinking is what we speak. Okay? Our confession must be personal. In other words, I am the righteousness of God. It must be positive. I am an overcomer. And it must be present tense. I am. I am. Not going to be, not used to be, not somewhere down the road, not later on, but right now. And then in Romans 4, 2, it says that Abraham became fully persuaded. Then in Ephesians 1, 4, it says, long before he laid earth's foundation, he had us in mind. Had settled on us as a focus of his love to be made whole and holy by his love. Now, I'm going to end it right here. You know, a key factor in changing your emotions is, as I said, is meditation. Years ago, I don't even know how many years ago it's been, honey, it's probably 10 years ago, somebody gave us a, uh, an audio recording of a guy with music in the background, and, a, and it's really about identity. It's a confession about identity. It's about nine minutes long. Uh, Seth put that uh, here, whoever, put that on the movement app. I looked a while ago. It's on the movement app. It's about nine minutes of meditation. I double dog dare you to listen to it. I mean, you listen to that and meditate on that and see yourself. Matter of fact, we've got the, about the first minute and a half of that. Uh, they're going to play for you right now, and then I'll then I'll close. Go ahead and play it if you would, please. Just close your eyes as they play this. I come as myself, just as I am this moment my feelings my fears my joys my sadnesses you see me as i really am you know me through and through you see all all that i am or ever have been every experience in my life is laid before you every image i have seen each touch each sensation every word i have ever heard or spoken each word, each idea, each thought which is imprinted in my soul and is known to you. You know me better than my closest friend. You know me better than I know myself. You know, and because of who I am, and in spite of what I am, you love me. I am of an estimable value to you. You love me through and through. Nothing, nobody can remove me from your Nothing, nobody can separate me from your love or your presence. We heads bow just for a second. You know, I'd encourage you, please take some time and and when it's where it's quiet and listen to that. If you got headphones, especially you'll put those headphones on and and just listen to that and let God minister to your heart about your identity. You know, read your Bible to find out what's right. And I promise you promise you, if you'll apply these things, your emotions are going to start changing. And I go back to the thing I said earlier. Guys, ladies, particularly I'm, t- I'm speaking to men, don't, don't think you've got to fight your emotional battles by yourself. You're not in it alone. You're, you're not an oddball. You're not weird. Get help. Your family needs you. Your friend needs you. We need you. We head bow just for a second. You're here today and you've never made a decision to ask Christ into your life. And each week, Pastor Rod, Pastor Jill gives everyone an opportunity to do this. And we don't want to put you on the spot. And because the way we so the way that we do this at Lumen Church is we all pray together. Everybody 
even people that have been walking with God for many, many, many years. We all pray it together. And it gives you an opportunity if you've never asked Christ in your life to make that decision without being necessarily put on a spot. So everybody pray this prayer with me, especially if you've never done that and you know you need to. Because really you do. You really need to. Everybody say it with me. Say, thank you, Jesus. You became my sin. You took my judgment. And the Bible says, if I believe that, in my heart and say with my mouth that Jesus is Lord you'll become my Lord and I do it right now Jesus I call you my Lord thank you for saving me 